I think we're live. What's up, LAC community? Uh, I'm Edgar Palacios, founder of the Latinx Education Collaborative. Um, we are working on increasing the representation of Latinx education professionals in K-12. Today, for today's Ask an Educator, my camera's kind of funky today, so I apologize. We're working through it. Um, so you might see me staring that way because I'm actually looking at Sebastian. I want to make eye contact even though I, he can't see me directly. Anyways, um, Thank you for joining us for another edition of Ask an Educator. Our guest today is Sebastian Barraza. Sebastian, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me over here. Uh, you know, thanks for joining us and thanks for being a part of our conversation today. Um, sure. So when do you start school? Actually, before we even go through any of that, for those of you, for those of us that don't know you as well, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, um, and share any, any kind of information that you'd like. Cool. Uh, so my name is Sebastian Barraza. Sebastian Barraza. Uh, I teach at the Kauf U Marion Kaufman School. Um, I up until this spring, I was a fifth grade specials teacher, um, the content lead for the physical, the physical education and health department. Um, and I, I was born in Peru. I grew up in Peru until I was the age of eleven. Moved to Texas. Uh, spent most of my middle school, high school, and college in there. I graduated from University of Texas at Arlington um, with a PE degree. Nice. And yeah, it's a really strange route that I took to where I'm at right now. Uh, and then I decided that I didn't want to do PE because I had this conception of what PE teachers were um, and what people thought about PE teachers. Mm. Um, so I was like, I don't want that label on me. Uh, so I was like, I, I want to do my first, my first passion, which is sports. I'm a really big fan of soccer. I love playing soccer. Um, and when I was doing my training, my college, I had the opportunity to coach a soccer team for middle school. And I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to do, I want to be in sports. I want to be in youth sports specifically. So then I went on the route of doing um, a master's uh, at the University of Yukon, University of Connecticut um, for sports, to be, to be involved in sports, uh, specifically youth sports. And then as I did that master's, I, I got, I grew kind of this dissolution with the idea of organized sports and how political and how not about the sport or the, the, the kids it is. Yeah. Um, but, so I decided to join Teach for America and can, that's how I got to Kansas City. And eventually somehow I ended up being back into a PE role, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is what I tried to avoid in the first place. But um, now with all these years of experience and this wealth of knowledge that I've gained over the last 10 years. Uh, this is actually something that I really cherish and something that I think is super important and I guess really overlooked a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's my journey. <laughs> that's cool. Um, I, I, I'm interested in a couple of things. So first and foremost, when you find out that you're going to Kansas City, like what are your initial thoughts? So uh, Teach for America has a funny way of placing people. Okay. Um, <laughs> You, they they allow you to select where you want to where you want to go and rank them in order. Uh, yeah. So I put my number one was Orlando, and then I had Denver, and then I had Dallas, and then blah blah blah, and then Kansas City was my number fourteenth choice. Um, so when I got, <laughs> when I, when I got my placement letter, that was definitely a surprise uh, because I wasn't even considering it as one of my top choices. Um, and then later on, I found out that Kansas City is a high need area, and if you put any Kansas City anywhere on your list, they're gonna place you in Kansas City. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Good cool. to Yeah. So I found that out later, and then I, when I when I finally got here, I know. So I looked at the map when I was at UConn, and I was like, it's in, literally in the middle of the country. If you take out all the board, all the state borders, all the city borders, Kansas City is smack in the middle of the country. So I was like, that's gonna be really interesting because I lived in the South and I lived in the East Coast. Yeah. Now I'm going to live in the middle of the country, um, which was cool, but I had no expectations. I had no idea what Kansas City was like. Um, in fact, I just thought it was like a regular Midwest town. Don't, nobody really thinks about it very much. Uh, and then I got here and it was amazing. And to TFA credit, they do a, a really good job of introing all their core members into the city and getting them acquainted with the educational scene, with the cultural scene, with the history of the city. So I had a really... Uh, good intro into Kansas City and I got to know the different different neighborhoods and different schools and the makeups of the schools, which really if you're in this work, that's that's kind of what you're here for. You're here for the people, not so much the sites, not so much yeah. the the 
experiences, the life things you're going to write about in your books later in life. Um, so that, I, th I thought that was really cool. And I really enjoyed it. The people that I came in with the core were really cool too. Um, and everybody that was in it, in the spaces that I was in, was very about the work, which is which is what what I joined too. So it was it just it just was a really good fit for me. That's cool, and I pre appreciate you sharing that. I'm glad that you put Kansas City on you know on your list, and you know <laughs> I'm glad that you know you were chosen to come here. So absolutely, just want to say hi to Nora. She goes, "Woo, Sebastian! <laughs> uh, good to see you, Nora. Thanks so much for all your support, um, as usual, and your friendship. I will say." Um, and Cristina Sebastián, an amazing educator. That's uh, my fiance, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> I, noticed my life, say, I, I noticed that she didn't say an amazing fiance, but you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll I'm working on that part. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, man, on on Thank getting you. engaged, and I hear you're getting married in October. Is that correct? Absolutely, October fifteenth. October fifteenth. What are you excited. excited? What are you excited most about it? About uh, so we chose a really cool location, uh, okay. Mori Point in San Francisco. Um, so I was born in the Pacific Ocean okay. uh, in, in Peru. Um, and I think one of my biggest dreams is to like make that part of my future with, with Christina. And so she was like, what about San Francisco? You know, it's pretty, she loves San Francisco and it's on the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. So she went through the, the she went through uh, like pages and pages of lists of Places where we could get married at, and she came out to this point at this location in a national park called Mori Point, and it's beautiful. It's like on a cliffside, yeah. um, it's overlooking the beach, and it's just it's 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 the Pacific Ocean, and you can't get better than that. Yeah. Um, and really, she's been doing a lot of the work, so I need to catch up a little bit on that. Uh, but well, you all, you all heard it here. Now we're gonna hold you accountable. Then so <laughs> you're gonna catch up. I know, up I know, here. I know. Now, I, now I have accountability, but yeah, yeah, accountability. The whole city. <laughs> So I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, one, so you happen to be um, a Latino man in education. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, only 2% of educators identify as Latino men. And so tell me a little bit about your journey as, as a man in, in, in this space. So there's there's a couple of things to this. So when I applied to, to Teach for America, and I didn't, even, I didn't even apply outright, I got recruited to be in Teach for America. Uh, I was already working on a community program in Connecticut in in the uh, less wealthy side of Hartford. Mm -hmm. And this guy came like came up to me after one of the sessions and said, you know, you do well with the kids. There's not enough teachers and there's not enough male teachers, especially specifically male teachers of color in education. Uh, and even more specifically, brown teachers. There's not there's not a whole lot of those. Um, so I think it would be a really good fit. And so I applied and, and it happened. Um, and in the past, I don't really think about it too much because I, I when I went to school in Texas, I, I was in PE, in mm -hmm. a PE program. And if you think about the makeup for whatever whatever reason it is, uh, if you think about the makeup of PE, of PE teachers, a lot of them are Latinos and a lot of them are black men. Um, yes. And it just kind of didn't really like figure in my mind that classroom teachers uh, or teachers in like a traditional content are Latino or are not Latino rather. Um, and then I kind of, kind of see that on my work currently as well. And like across other schools in, in the, in the city, um, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of us out there. So I think I'm just trying to think like when I grew up in Peru, uh, in elementary school in Peru, I had, I had a few, I didn't have very many. Um, when I grew in Texas, I didn't have very many either, but it never figured in my mind until I actually was actually in it. And there are, I don't have, I don't have very many peers next to me. So, uh, I think for a kid, it's just really important to see themselves in the people that are, the people that are providing them with like life advice and content that they're going to use for the rest of their lives. And just like a model for, for what it looks like. And not that I'm the best model, but I think they need to see themselves in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, and it, it's incredible. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of data that backs that re that that backs that statement up. Um, but I'm sure you also have a lot of lived experience and a lot of stories that you can share where um, that connection is strong and is felt. Um, yes or no? Absolutely. And I think you know the the, the thing about being being a professional, although you guys you probably hear this a lot. Um, uh, I know I felt it a lot. Is something called the, the imposter syndrome. 
where you don't really feel like you belong or like you earn your spot. Um, and I definitely felt that when I joined Teach for America because they, I got recruited because I was a Latino man. Um, so I think f there's two parts to this. Like one is overcoming that, like knowing that yes, you do belong, you, you work for this and it's part, it's part of something. And the second part is getting the students that are looking up to you to not even consider that as part of, as, as a reason why their success might be lesser than yeah. Um, and it, I think there's times where the first part doesn't come through for me in my mind, yeah. but the second part keeps me going because I can't I can't let kids down, you know. It's, it's it, if I can't let them experience what I what I've experienced, um, and they are earning it. Like they're they're as smart as any other kid in the city. They're as hardworking as any other kid in the city. So it wouldn't be fair for me to let my that first part overcome yeah. the the work that I have to do. So. No, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, a, a lot of us deal with imposter syndrome, particularly in um, we talk about white supremacist culture a lot at the LEC and uh, understanding that the systems weren't designed for black and brown folks um, to, to be successful. Um, it's one of those really, you know, interesting, like um, vestiges, I think, of white supremacy system, which would be imposter syndrome. Uh, before I continue, just want to acknowledge that you're getting a lot of love. And on our on our uh, live stream here, so we have Lucero who says West Coast, best coast. Uh, That's the Lucero is a phenomenal educator and author as well. Just want to shout that out. Um, Monica Curls, hashtag representation matters, absolutely. Um, and she's a great supporter of the LEC. So thank you so much, Monica. Um, Linda says yes. Sebastian, so thankful to teach alongside you. At least you have folks that like you, man. I think that that's such a win. I appreciate all of them. I appreciate all of them. Again, the imposter syndrome is gonna, it's gonna pull me back a little bit, but I, I appreciate the love a whole lot. Thank you know, you much, we're gonna make sure that um, we, 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 we walk alongside you in that journey and getting rid of imposter syndrome. And so we, sure. we, we elevate your, 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 your genius here. Um, Casey, and Kyle, I'm yeah. so lucky to have you. I'm so lucky to know you, Sebastian, proud of you. At the same time, you know, I think it like it keeps you on, keeps me on my toes, you know, uh, yeah. because I I feel like I at, at every point I have to prove what I can do and like I actually belong. So it, uh, it's a double edged sword. Like sometimes it'll, it'll get me down, but yeah. I think it also helps me stay on top of my game. So absolutely, I can and I can understand that. I mean, I think that's a that's a valid valid point. We said if it's exactly representation matters, so much rides on who we see in positions of power, authority, and success as young black and brown kids. Um, I never had a Latino teacher for if for what it's worth. I had Latino yeah. teachers. I never had a Latino teacher, so that's that's good. You know, I, I, and you may be. I mean, I, I think about that. Like even in today, so we're twenty twenty. Um, Latinos make up 17% of the United States population. Um, they make up at least 25% of all students in K-12. And for some of our students, like you may be the first and only Latino teacher that they'll have. That's, I mean, that's, that, it, it makes me feel good for me, but it also makes me kind of worried for like yeah. what, what other experiences they have, they have had, what things they've been exposed to and stuff. So. But, you know, part of our organization, the work that we're trying to accomplish is continue to elevate the, your voice in, in this space and to make sure that you know how much you're loved and you're valued by the community and how important you are to to the work in general. Right. Because it's um, our students absolutely deserve folks like yourself in the classroom um, and they need you. Right. They need to see you in, in those spaces like you've mentioned a couple of times. So just know that you have a community of support here <laughs> with you alongside you making, you know, thank you. Thank you. Um, what, and let, just, let me just give you a shout out because I, you know, I, you probably see me on these videos commenting and liking things. Yeah, I think, I think what you guys are doing is incredible, and it's there's no value like there's no you cannot can't put a value to it because it's it's so it's so important for the teachers, for the community, for the students, for the for the city, for just across even across the, the country. Like somebody sees these, I'm gonna and I'm gonna link this to my family. Uh, they're, gonna, <laughs> they're gonna link this and they're gonna see this and they're like wow there's there's actually people getting recognized and and latinos are actually coming up and like you know they're they're being seen which is i mean i would tell you my my mom and my dad probably at some point were like teacher you know i don't know about teacher <laughs> but uh uh if they see stuff like this you know and it's not just me but it's like everybody that gets gets on these things um, yeah 
it's it's a big shout out for us and and no, it's all because of what you guys are doing so well i appreciate that man you know i think for us and for me particularly part of the reason that the organization started was because like I so believe in our community. I so believe in the students. And I, when I think about leadership development and all these other representation areas, right, all the industries and, and all this stuff, I think about where leadership starts and begins. And I believe that it begins first day of kindergarten, maybe first day of pre-K, if you're lucky to have access to pre-K. And so if we can get our community to, to see themselves from the very beginning, um, you know, I can only imagine what kind of opportunities does that open up for them as as, as potential leaders and as, and as as you know can we model a different way of also living right can we model a different way of saying like it's cool to be who you are and it's cool to be able to do these things um and not face the same challenges or similar challenges that we face growing right. up right so i appreciate that um let's see so says thank you so much for all you do at our school arriba arriba Anytime I get to do the double R, I get excited. And Monica, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta roll them, man. You gotta you gotta roll roll the so let me ask you this. So I don't meet a lot of Peruvians. Okay. Just like I don't meet a lot of Nicaraguenses, like Fair myself. Um, tell me, like, what what kind of tipo de orgullo, what kind of pride do you have in being Peruvian? Like, what do you like to bring to your students <laughs> from from that lens? Uh, there's a lot, man. Uh, there's, I, I, I don't do it too much because I, um, for some reason I just don't, I just don't like want to over, overwhelm them with one aspect of what Latino being Latino means and that, that is yeah. my national identity. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot, I mean, I, I, I will always brag about Peruvian food. Uh, it's been recognized worldwide <laughs> for decades. So I will always shout out Peruvian food. Yeah. Um, the Incas, man, the Incas were from Peru, you know, like one of the biggest empires uh, in Amer in the Americas before the colonizers came, you know, uh, and they were they were based in Cusco, which is in the middle of Peru, uh, which kind of like Kansas City is the middle of, of, of United States. Um, this, I, re I just really love how, and this doesn't just, this isn't just about Peruvians, but I think Latinos in general, Latinas, Latinas and Latinos in general, um, and all the other pronouns, that go along yeah. with it um, have the different type of energy um, that I don't I don't really it's not that I don't see it in in other spaces but I it just feels different it just feels more alive um, like I, for example like I, I just want to give like a an anecdote my dad my dad um, he passed away a year ago in July first like a year ago um, but everything he did he did at a 100 you know and he never he never like slow it down for anything whether it was just like chilling on the couch he's, he's chilling at 100 you know <laughs> uh, and i think that's like a very latin thing to do you know like a latin just live and right. they don't just they don't work they live you know and they work is part of their life but they just live and i, I just think that's really exciting and i see it um christina is a kindergarten teacher at guadalupe center elementary school yeah um and I, I get to interact with a lot of those kids and with a lot of those parents and families in that community because of her and those those families and that community is just so alive, and it's just so vibrant. And I think it's it it's just, it's just great. And I, I, I sometimes I miss it so much that I just kind of I have to like do something to get me into it. Um, and I don't know. That's what that's kind of what I want what I try to bring to yeah. people that don't know it or don't experience it as much as I have. You know, I, I appreciate uh, first and foremost, man, I'm sorry to hear about your father's loss, um, but I also, you know, living in, in his honor and his legacy and bringing his stories up, that, that is so important. And, and telling the stories of your family is um, it's part of the work narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to own it. So uh, thank you for sharing that and, and elevating sure. his voice and bringing him into the conversation. Um, yeah, you're right. I think that um, our, our culture is, is incredibly beautiful and diverse, right? And so we have to acknowledge that um, we come from 32, 33 different countries from backgrounds, right? We have different traditions, cultures. We, sure. you know, run the gamut of, of race and, and and everything else. And so um, there is, I, I, I tend to believe there is a certain energy that comes along with being Latino. Um, I could be wrong, but I, you know, every Latino that right. I met, like, you know, it's just, it's just a different type of vibe, right? Yeah, I think um, you're right. And, you know, I also love what you said. Like when we relax, we relax at a hundred. <laughs> yeah, hundred like percent, man. I love it. It's, you know, it's great. It, it it is who we are. Also, the music. I can't like you can't beat the music. Yeah, so I yeah, uh, yeah. just kind of bringing some more folks into the conversation. 
Uh, Celestian picked up teaching science <laughs> via Zoom last spring and worked incredibly hard to master the concept before sessions and students. He also is so skilled at developing meaningful connections with kids while also working with kids and families to make sure all their needs are met so they are ready to learn. It's, you know what? I love love. Can we talk about that for a second? I love love. I love that people are loving on you. I love that, you know, your soon to be wife is loving on you. This is this is what it's about. Um, Ariel, thanks so much for joining us. He's friggin' killing the science game. All right. <laughs> so the science thing. So, you know, you know how uh, the world kind of changed this spring. Yeah. Um, and I was a PE teacher and I, was, I thought I was doing okay. You know, like, you know, I was content lead and it was, I was trying to build up a health for health program, blah, blah, blah. And then COVID happened, which is unfortunate for a lot, a whole lot of reasons. Um, and they were like, well, we can't do, we can't do PE virtually. It's kind of hard to do that. Uh, so we need you to do something and we need help in science. So um, they played me in science and I had two really good mentors, uh, Brenna Janish and Camille Borgmeier at, at Kaufman. Yeah. Um, and they kind of guided me, but then I just kind of like try to take it on my own and see and do, do what I can with the experience that I have from the classroom. And I, I don't know if, if you've ever seen a PE teacher be still, it's kind of hard for us just to be still. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do it with my voice and with my mannerisms and with my face and stuff like that. Um, and I, it kind of worked out, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm the best science teacher, but I definitely bring, try to bring a little bit of energy to it and a little bit of personality to it. So I mean, it, it's, it's still good. Science can be fun. And I think, you know, like as long as you're proving that and the kids are engaging with the content, you know, and you're demonstrating growth, like that's that's awesome. Um, yeah. More people here sending you love still have the friendship bracelet he brought back from Peru for our whole class. Thanks, Linda, so, for joining us. <laughs> I try to do that every, every time I go to Peru, I try to bring this bracelet for all the kids and my and my partner teachers. Look at, so, look at this, man. Like, you are you're the, you're the teacher to, to like, model after. <laughs> most committed to innovating and adjusting to help an individual student's success. Um, you, you are right. You have a whole fan club. Um, and then Katie also yeah, said, thanks for joining us, Katie, also in the fan club. <laughs> so when are you writing for president? Because this is what I'm hearing. Like, hey, man, you know, you know what? Uh, I can't run for president because I wasn't born in the United States, but I don't know. Rules change. Hey, you know, they do change. Uh, but <laughs> on that note, though, I have been, I don't know if the people at Kaufman and Christina, because they, she hears me all the time, have yeah. picked up on this. I'm really into politics uh, and I'm really following a lot of the political climates in nationally, locally and statewide. Um, and I think this is this is this year is extremely important. So you won't catch me not paying attention to politics at any moment of the day. And I know some of my coworkers that are giving me love right now are might or might, might be tired of it because I talk about it all the time. But uh, Christina specifically probably is like, man, he talks about it all the time. Uh, but I, I do get support from everybody. So thank you for thank you for caring about this. Uh, thank you for Christina for like pushing me to do the things that I do. Um, I know politics is like a, a grim topic at the moment. Um, for tons of reasons, yeah. Um, but uh, hey, you know, you you might not be too far off with that with that push. So, you know, I you know, we we need representation, right? And I think yeah. that we also have to acknowledge that um, we have a lot of voices that are not represented um, in, in in politics in areas. And so, not not to say that you know, like I'm one. I don't want you out of the classroom first and foremost. Like that would be anti whatever we're trying to do over here at the in the organization. But also, like you know, if you want to consider it, like I think that uh, clearly you have an incredible base of support. And so, we won't announce your your political campaign today. <laughs> you know, maybe within the, within a couple of months or so, we can. Um, Yo, man, look at this. Incredible, incredible human. I am thankful for him taking on science. Sebastian is selling himself so short. We love him and his political activist self. <laughs> Sebastian has grown more than any other teacher at our school. He blows me away. I also love that he's a kid at heart and the kids love it too. So I got to say, Susana was not supposed to be on this, apparently. And so she heard about you and what you're trying to do. And so as a math teacher herself, she's going to talk to you a little bit about science and politics. Cool. And so we're going to actually cool. do this for the first time in LEC education history. Right. We're going to we're going to shift. And so I'm going to bring her on and just say hello to her. Cool. And then I'm going to take off. Sounds good. Honored. Thanks for having me, man.
Hey, thank you. Susana, what's up? Hey, uh, hi, gentlemen. I was listening to your um, stuff on the, on the background just now. I hear that um, you're from Peru and that you love politics, so I'm ready to like dive into that. Susana uh, loves to talk about politics, and she was like, she just texted me. She's like, uh, can I get on on this? So, uh, Susana, take it away. Yes. Mayaga, thank you so much for transitioning. Hi, Sebastian. Hi. Um, I'm Susana Elisaraz. I'm the chief community officer of the organization. Um, and I heard a lot about you this morning um, and you being on this afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And for the, for the record, I watch all these videos, so I'm very familiar. <laughs> I think I heard. I, I, think, I think you had mentioned um, that you you watch all of our lives so it's like mm -hmm. feeling a little famous you know <laughs> so uh <laughs> this is this no, is definitely I, just being in here with edgar and with you is starstruck moment for me so this is good 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 that means a lot um that you watch our things and you've stuck around so um i i hear that you've also gotten a lot of love uh, with the comments uh and everything so shout out to your your, you know, your village and your crew that you got uh, behind you. That's awesome. Uh, you're at Kaufman, right? The Kaufman, yes. You mean you mean in Kaufman School? What are your? Um, I know the big topic right now is all about uh, school reopenings, and so what are your thoughts about? Um, obviously, you know, it'd be difficult to share if you didn't like the Kaufman no, plan, no problem. but I know. <laughs> I know that no. they're they're planning on online. So, what are your thoughts about that? So, so this I think just to just to start off, I think my school is extremely privileged in that we have the resources to do online and do it well. Um, and we have an incredible staff. We have incredible leadership that are make are making it possible. Um, and that's just to say that not not every school has that. Uh, there's tons of schools that have a quarter or less of the resources that we have, or even the staff. You know. Um, and I think I'm very happy for me and for my students and for the families that I'm going to be in charge of. Um, but it also puts me in like in, um, in a mindset of what, what can I do for the other schools? Like what, how can I elevate that message? And, uh, I don't know if people in this chat see me on Facebook, always arguing on governor Parsons's Facebook and on Quentin Lucas's Facebook and on all the other Facebook pages that post about Missouri education. Um, but it's like, it's not really just about me, right? It's like about, or my school, it's about all the other kids that are gonna be potentially be putting in harm's way and their families and the teachers that are going to those schools. And I just don't, I just don't see how that makes sense. It's not something worth risking, so. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. And I've been reading a lot our community has been reading a lot of articles around like how it feels that teachers these days are sacrificial. Um, and that's just not a good feeling for, for, you know, people who have really dedicated their lives to um, students and their families. And really, I think teachers already are very um, willing to go above and beyond. Um, Absolutely. And so to feel stretched this much, I think, I mean, just isn't a good feeling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I, so speaking of politics, uh, Edgar mentioned that I, I'm a big fan as well. Um, and you mentioned it being a grim topic right now. Uh, this being one of the reasons why, right? With COVID and like you said, with governor Parsons and, um, the, the needs of the people not always feeling like it's number one, especially our students, um, what would you say about the fact that a lot of educators that I've talked to that brush up against or that kind of are struggling with their their positions in education, it has a lot to do with politics. Um, just like either the politics of education or the politics of, of um, like the education system in general. I think it's one of the big reasons that a lot of educators struggle to stay in the field do you have any thoughts about that yeah i mean i have a lot of thoughts about that um specifically with well just to start off with te teachers don't get don't get recognized nearly as much as they should um like the amount of work that a that teacher does on a day-to-day -day basis 
is doesn't match the salary, their benefits, the the recognition that at all that it deserves. Um, and then there was also like if you put like it put it into like political terms, there's there's been I would say for like at least a decade a very strong push to make that even worse, you know, <laughs> uh, to make to make teachers even less valued in society. Um, I did my my did my institute for Teach for America in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is notorious for for its mistreatment of teachers and not listening to teachers and not paying attention to the needs of teachers. Um, many teachers in Oklahoma have left the classroom. Uh, that left the classroom in Oklahoma to go to other states, which is unfortunate. Um, I, I think if you're a teacher and you care about the work and you care about the mission of being a teacher and the, the purpose of education, uh, I think politically that there's no, there's, it's not a choice. Like you just, it, it just doesn't make sense for you to not support somebody who also values education. Um, Governor Parsons, Clearly doesn't. <laughs> he, he cut the he cut the not to get too political, but he cut the educational budget by ten million dollars pretty recently. Um, and just the idea of putting kids, families, educators, staff, janitors, cafeteria members at risk for money for the economy it doesn't just doesn't make sense to me. Um, teachers already work like you said. Teachers already work their butts off to create virtual plans to talk to families to make arrangements to to do whatever they can to make sure the kids get a good education and if this is the this is the payback that that they get i don't blame them for not feeling valued and like looking elsewhere for their professional um, affirmation um it is sad but it is not their fault you know it's like i it's people can only go so far uh, and it's, it's they just have we just have to be valued more and i'm not just talking about me i'm talking about like every other teacher who's doing, doing incredible things teach all the teachers at my school uh, my fiance is an incredible teacher um there's teachers that we don't even hear about that are doing incredible things that are getting put in like harm's way for for something silly you know it just doesn't make sense to me yeah yeah um absolutely i i think um it's it it does get to the point where it's exhausting um especially for those of us that strive to be quality um educators i mean i know i know when i was in the classroom it was exhausting to try to keep up with scopes and sequences and with curriculum changes and with textbook uh, changes so it was just consistently decisions being made for us that felt um like they didn't take into consideration us as teachers and then our students in the classroom. Um, it, it is really inspiring to be around educators and teachers who are just like so resilient, like, okay, this is what we're doing next, you know? Um, and so I'm glad that you have that same experience at Kaufman because like you said, the student um, um, really uh, proficiency, right? And student uh, care and student happiness um, should come first, right? Mm -hmm. So um, tell us about, I, I heard you're in STEM, right? Uh, I'm teaching, I'm currently teaching planning for science. I thought science in the spring. I was in physical education and health up for four years and then all of this happened. I uh, got switched to science to cover where I needed to cover. And currently I'm, I'm planning for science as well for sixth grade. And there you go. There's another example of like yeah. as teachers were like, all right, here we go. This is what yeah. I'm doing next. Um, so how are you feeling? How, what are you thinking about sixth grade science? I was a sixth grade teacher um, my my whole teaching career. And so I love sixth grade. What are you thinking about teaching sixth grade science? I am. I'm very excited for it. Um, so my when I first applied to be a teacher in Kansas City, I applied to be a high school biology teacher. Um, and that was like something that I was really passionate about. And I did something different for the last four years, but just getting back to that is very exciting to me. Also, science is has the benefit of getting like the best of both worlds, like ELA math and then creativity and just everything experiment hand like hands-on experimentation. Uh, science is science is just cool, honestly. So and we're, there's not enough uh, Latinos and Latinas in science. Yeah, that's what I was gonna mention next actually, is that first of all there aren't very many male uh, or men in our fields. 
And then on top of that, um, being a Latino male in STEM, um, what are your thoughts about the impact that that has on your students of color? We know that representation matters. Statistics show that um, kiddos of color are more likely to go to high school and graduate high school and all of that when they have teachers of color. Um, what are your thoughts around that? So let me let me tell you one thing. My I have one of my brothers who is an aerospace engineer, and my other brother is a pathologist. So science is very very much in my family, um, and really. I look to them to like to see what is, what is possible, right? Um, and I think if I look to them and they're only like eight or nine years young, older than me, kids that are 15 young, years younger than me, 20 years younger than me, are gonna be seeing even more on the person that's leading them. So uh, like, like I was telling Edgar, I think it's just, it's just knockout important. Like, the, like you have to be able to see that it's possible yeah absolutely um we have a question from um our um audience so robert thank you for being with us the question is how can we empower teachers and or individuals who are putting their hearts out there to support our youth without being penalized with policies that are restrictive to those who are wanting to do something about it without getting punished so i think um what 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 do we do to empower teachers who are putting their hearts out there? Um, so as a teacher who puts their hearts out there, what would you like to see um, differently in that aspect? So I'm, I'm going to bring it back to politics. I think being civically engaged is is the key. Like if the, the people that are making the decisions um, that are to put teachers in per precarious situations um, are not some sometimes not getting accountable not being accountable to their to their constituents and teachers are constituents um, teachers vote teachers participate in civic actions teachers do like teachers engage communities daily on like 30 families a day or more um, and I think there's like there's such like this stigma and I, I don't think it's a stigma actually I think it's real um, of of being a not a, maybe not necessarily a whistleblower but somebody who's who's vocal and active uh and they might face blowback for it which is a real thing you know like everybody's has to have that kind of fear in them because it, it might happen you never know what the person above you is going to do or say or think about your activities or your words um but i i would just push people to like be more active and be communicate with even even if it's not vocally in public uh with their families and with their friends about the, the needs of teachers and the needs of students and uh, for example like i'll talk to my mom about why schools in a certain side of town might need more help or uh, i'll talk to my brothers about what um uh, what the school to prison pipeline is and why like you know and those are things that they don't see every day they might know about they might have heard about it, but they don't see every day and i'm the closest person that they have to that to that uh industry or that uh, the area of, of profession. And if I'm not talking about it to them, nobody else is going to be talking about it to them. So I think it's just like making your voice heard to the people that you can influence the most. Mm -hmm. You know what? Uh, that makes me think about something that is very underrated um, in our profession, I think, um, which is making connections with families, um, the families of our students included. Um, I know that there were times as a teacher, as the only Latina, as of one of very few people of color, um, I, I taught in the neighborhood where I live, where I grew up. Um, the ideas that I had uh, maybe pushed back against um, the, the white normative system, right? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times, there were times when having the support of my parents, meaning my kids' parents, mm -hmm. made the difference um, because it was easier to say, or I, I guess easier is the wrong word, but having that support of a parent saying, I know Susana or Miss Ellie, you know, has the, the best interest of my kids. Um, and so I'm going to support her on this decision. I think that's really underrated. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we think of that as often when we think like, who can support us as teachers? Um, why Why is that? Why do we not engage with families and communities as often as we could? So as I think it goes back to like what 
the value of teachers in society, you know, like teachers don't like just being a teacher doesn't in society doesn't give you a whole lot of clout. Um, so I guess teachers, a lot of teachers, including myself, don't feel like our voice is really that valuable or like really that really that impactful. But it is um, like we're working with kids eight hours a day. We're communicating with parents weekly uh, about everything. Um, we're in charge of kids for nine months, 10 months out of the year. Um, sometimes even more. Um, we have we have we have connections beyond just the content, you know. Um, and I I person I personally feel sometimes like I don't like it's not my place to talk to a parent or a family about something that is not content related or or it, school related. But the those are those are the people that can make the help you make change. Um, and in fact, they are there. You are there for them uh to make change in their lives with their kids so the change that you want to make is already beneficial to them so I, I think i think it's just like trying to recover or like take back the value of being a teacher um because it's been taken away from teachers uh just take trying yeah. like forcing uh our hands to take it back because it, mm -hmm. it's the value is there it just we just need to recover it you, who's in charge of that who you know because i agree with you i agree that the value of teachers, I don't know if it's always been this low, but is it the, like, should we look to the media to like make that better? Or do we look to politics again? Like, I, it's just a question that I've kind of always asked myself, like, where do we go from here? Who do we influence in order for teachers to be better appreciated? I and mean, definitely it has to do with politics and, and politics are driven by media, so, and by money. Um, I, I I think going back again to the politics part of it, and it's like it, a lot of specifically minority communities feel disenfranchised by the political system. Um, Latinos and um, Native Americans and the Black community they feel disenfranchised by it, and sometimes they feel like their vote doesn't matter, so they so they don't, and that's justified because their vote sometimes doesn't feel like it matters. Um, and I, I think a lot of a lot of politicians that are bad actors rely on that on that disenfranchisement and sometimes voter suppression um, to continue the hegemony of like teachers not being valued and uh, professions that support the public not being valued as much as you know a, a Wall Street power broker or or some some other position of traditional power. Yeah. I'm asking, I'm asking these tough questions because when I hear that, like you're a politics fan, I'm like, oh, finally, because I, <laughs> these are questions I struggle with myself. And I'm, I'm like, you know, now being one of the leaders of the organization, I, I strive to think about where do we, where are our places to jump in and advocate? Um, where are our places to jump in and speak up for teachers who don't feel they can speak up for themselves, you know? Um, because like you said, the, the value um, isn't always there. Um, I don't know if you've answered this question for Edgar yet, um, but what what are you looking forward to in the future? I mean, it sounds like you have a really great support system over at Kaufman. Um, you're looking forward to a new position this year. What are you looking forward to this year or in the future? This year specifically, I'm looking forward to like just making it through, honestly, and getting everybody that's with me through the year. Um, through everything that this year is going to throw at us because it, it, coronavirus is not over and politics is not over. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's about to get pretty intense. Uh, so just like having the fortitude of mind to get through it, um, I think it's, it's like my number one goal. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, uh, I've really tried to focus a lot of my free time into being politically engaged and being mm -hmm. civically engaged and learning more about local politics and pushing others that are in my sphere of influence to be involved as well. Um, and I know local politics is one thing that gets gets forgotten pretty often, mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually the most important one. Uh, yeah. Local politics are the ones that affect the most. Um, so I think just trying to use my, my, my platform as a teacher, as somebody who has a, even a small sphere of influence to get people around me engaged and Getting, getting them like increasing their knowledge and increasing their activity, increasing their voice and stuff like that. Yeah, 
Um, so l let's say you had a three-step program for <laughs> educators and getting more politically engaged um, or two-step, you know, what can I, Susana Lizarraz, do in August? What can I do in November, you know, to, to make these changes or like to like make my voice heard and advocate for my students at the same time? So I think one and one th one thing that I don't see a whole lot of is organizing among educators. Mm. Um, I guess that's something that has been on my mind for a while already, and something that I kind of want to get into and see if I can, maybe not pioneer, but like at least try to make happen in Kansas City is mm -hmm. organizing among educators. So the educators, a lot of educators have similar views and similar um, voices that are not as productive individually, but they would be uh, collectively. Um, and I think we can, we can, there's a lot of space for that to make change. Um, uh, so I think the first thing that I would do is just, like try to set up some, some set up a way of organizing teachers, and teacher voices and teachers actions. Um, and then after that, I think empowering teachers to like just be active in general, even on, even not collectively, just on their own, just be vocal. And I've seen a lot of that in Facebook and social media this, this year because of coronavirus and because of the, uh, the George Floyd killings mm -hmm. and the the protests against police brutality. I've seen a lot of stuff on social media that gives me a lot of encouragement, mm -hmm. and I just don't want it to die down mm -hmm. in in after November the third because it won't be over. Um, mm -hmm. It's the, the injustices of this country and this, this state and this city were not built in one year, and they're not going to be taken down in one year. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to continue carrying that energy into next year, and then two years from now, and then as long as we can and we have we have the we have the reach we have mm -hmm. this biggest spheres of influences like we, we speak to hundreds of families a year so yeah. um i think we just need to carry that voice and organize and just make it happen and and, and continue continue it yeah i see in the comments sarah cooper um thanks sarah i know she was on a little earlier um sebastian's very active in public forums on political matters. I appreciate that, Sebastian. And Christina Faye, all of his free time goes into volunteering for political campaigns. Every campaign he volunteers for places more value on teacher and human rights. Um, as, as an educator, as a um, human, um, I appreciate the dedication you have um, to, to those things because, I mean, it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting to, to like, First of all, be engaged. Like even to listen can be exhausting because some of the stuff you hear is like, really, is that where we are? Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, to, to take action is just as exhausting. Um, now, I, um, I'm thinking about this year and I remember when Black Lives Matter was established, was it 2016? Mm -hmm. um, I was... I was pretty involved as a teacher and, you know, I, I had gotten involved with it way back then. And I remember I felt crazy because a majority of the teaching sphere wasn't on the same page yet. Mm -hmm. um, Black Lives Matter, I think, felt very liberal, I think, to people back then. It felt very um, extreme, extremist. Exactly. Um, and you just touched on the fact that this year with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, it feels like more people have gotten on board. What what do you think that's about? So I think a bunch of things. I think the I think people are getting smarter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, educators are we're doing our jobs where people are getting smarter. Um, yeah. The electorate is changing, um, and I think that is very important. I think ten, maybe ten years ago. Um, if, you, if you told people that uh, defund the police or something like that, they would have been like, you're crazy. Yeah. No, that's never going to pass. No city is ever going to vote for it. But now we have Compton, uh, sorry, Camden, New Jersey, Minneapolis, considering, considering, or not, not even considering, actually acting on those, on those things. Um, yeah. And I think it has to do with the electorate. You know, people are getting, young people are getting smarter. Uh, people that we lead that are in, in five, six, seven, eight years are going to be voting. Mm -hmm. are much, much more vocal and much more uh, ambitious and courageous than maybe we have been in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, at, at, and I think for a politician who's trying to main, maintain his seat or, or a politician that's trying to gain a seat, 
they can't ignore it. They cannot yeah. ignore ignore that this is this is a movement. You know, it's not a temporary thing. The, pe the people that are going to become part of the electorate in the next few years are going to be part of the electorate for the next 80 years. So, mm -hmm. and they cannot ignore that. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to a thought I've had this whole time, which is the fact that we influence and we lead um, young adults, right, in our jobs. And so um, there's a culture historically in schools, which is that I'm the expert and you're not. And so listen to me. Um, but how you knowing what you know about politics, you being this passionate about um, constituent rights and human rights, how do you um, empower your kids to lead um, their passion, lead with their passions and understand what their rights are? I think so. In just in, in terms of like basic traditional politics, I mean, there's like the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and then there's and there's like this idea that you well not this idea, but it's real. Like you're not supposed to talk about like politicize education and so on and so forth. You're not supposed to inf like unduly influence a child in their political views. But this is it's not really what you're doing. You're educating them and you're empowering them. Um, and truth is freedom. Education is freedom. Um, and they're not doing something for political ends. So they're not thinking in a certain way for political ends. They just know more. They just yeah. know better. Um, and I think the best empowerment that we can give a kid is the empowerment of knowledge and the empowerment of, of understanding the world around them. Um, and if if they if that ends up leading to a, a political consequence or a political effect, then so be it. But we're, we're not doing anything political. We're doing something like something ethical you know like we're educating kids so we're just giving them the we're just giving them the tools to make decisions of the world around them on their own exactly um i know there were times in my teaching when i had difficult conversations with my kids and i was like hey let's look at what really is happening here and how this systematically is going to impact your life long term um and the fact that you're going to have to function in the system for at least another six years. And so um, let's look at what that's going to look like. And like you said, it's not like leaning toward, okay, are you Democratic or are you Republican? Or do you support this candidate or the other? It's just like, how do you civically engage in the mm -hmm. rights that you have as, a, as an American, um, regardless of your um, status, regardless of your um, birthplace, um, just empowering kids in that way because they they have those instincts already. Um, most kids have those instincts already, where they're like, "That doesn't feel right," or "That doesn't sound right," you know. Uh, but they're taught to comply and just listen because we're the experts, right? Um, Christina took a, a quote from you and said, "We're doing something ethical." Um, she quoted it and has claps. Uh, so. I, I totally agree, and I'm really sad because we're nearing the end of our time together. Clearly, you and I need to uh, <laughs> touch base more often because I, I really do enjoy these conversations, and I appreciate, and like I always say to educators, I appreciate um, the impact that you're having on kids in our city. Um, I Thank really you. am happy to know that kids We'll have you in their classrooms this August, um, regardless of what that looks like online, half online, and you know, Thank on you. walking, running. So, you know, <laughs> I know you're gonna get it done, and teachers are gonna get it done. Thank um, you. Yes, we are all gonna get it done. Yes. Any thoughts or questions or any thoughts to leave our community with before we wrap up? No, uh, just talk to, try to talk to your family, your friends, try to talk to your community. Just be vocal. Don't think that your voice doesn't matter because it does. Um, and I will do the same on my part. And I'll talk yes. to you. Yes. Sebastian, I appreciate that. And I'm sure on behalf of the LEC community, um, we appreciate knowing that you exist and that you're doing the real work out there. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm inspired. I hope LEC community, you feel inspired. As always, please, um, Sebastian, let us know how we can support you. Absolutely. And Thank you so much. You're, you're already doing it. You're already, no. this, is, this is all incredible already. Like the fact that you guys are even putting these things together, like I told Edgar, is, is mind blowing and just such a service to everybody. So Good. thank you for doing it. Uh, 
we 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 are are proud to do it um, because educators deserve it. We know that the the t the work is tough, and so being here for you guys is the least that we can do. Um, again, thank you everyone, LEC community, for being with us, Sebastian. So many thank yous to you um, for being with us this afternoon, Kaufman family. I see you out here representing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Um, have a good evening and a good weekend. You as well. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. Bye. Bye.